Hello everyone! I hope you all had a lovely reading week and had a chance to rest and relax just a little bit before the end of our semester. Today we're going to be starting chapter 16 where we're going to deal with health and stress. So as per usual we'll start off with our general description or general definition um, and talk about what is stress. So stress is a fairly general term and it's used to refer to a whole range of concepts. So we might talk about stress as sort of uh, external environmental stimuli, our stressors, and internal experiences and bodily responses might be stress responses. And both of those can be referred to as stresses. Now this ambiguity can be problematic. As we've hopefully figured out at this point in the course, being able to have a precise and specific definition is going to be crucial to our ability to make any kind of conclusions or especially comparisons between research. So precise language and having um, sort of well understood definitions can be very, very important, um, especially when these terms might be interpreted one way or another. So for clarity's sake, we're going to refer to stressors as external stimuli and events that are occurring outside of our body, things that represent a perceived potential for harm, loss, damage, challenge, or other kind of deviation from our internal balanced state. So anything that pushes us outside of our normal sort of homeostatic balance. Stress responses are going to refer to our internal integrated psychological, uh, meaning cognitive, um, as well as behavioral responses to those external stressors that help to try and restore that internal balanced state. So stressors would sort of push us out of balance and a stress response would be our body's response to try and get us back into balance. Our important figure for stress research would be Hans Seeley, which I'm sure I'm pronouncing incorrectly, but he's sometimes referred to as the father of stress research. And he was especially important because he emphasized the fact that stress might have a positive effect in our lives. So the quote here from him is that stress is unavoidable, and in fact, it would be undesirable to avoid it. I have often said that stress is the spice of life. It can be a great stimulus to achievement. So unlike most other sort of concepts and views of stress, where people assume that it's a negative factor, um, Hans was focusing in on this idea that it might be beneficial to experience some stress. And so the part that we're going to take away from this is the distinction between good and bad stress. So you stress is our good stress. This would include sort of external circumstances and internal emotional experiences, as well as bodily responses that can be beneficial and motivating. So an example of this would be uh, experiences like marriage, uh, having or adopting a child, getting a promotion at work, or being confronted with some kind of manageable challenge in your everyday life. So it's something that motivates you, that pushes you to better yourself, that pushes you to move forward, and leads to general benefits overall in your life. In contrast, we can talk about distress as bad stress. So this would be our external circumstances, internal emotional experiences, and bodily responses that can be harmful, reduce motivation, and impair function. So this is usually when we encounter situations that are perceived as negative, things like being the victim of a crime, the loss or death of a loved one, failing a test, um, or experiencing challenges that are beyond your capacity. So things that are too much for you to handle and that end up leading to sort of negative outcomes. So those are our distinctions here between positive and negative types of stress. Now, it might seem kind of weird to think of stress as beneficial, but there are actually quite a few studies that have looked at this exact relationship. Specifically, the yerkes dodson law describes an inverted U-shaped curve that describes the relationship between stress and performance. So if we look at this diagram down at the bottom that I've borrowed from another text, we have 
um, sort of efficiency of performance. And then here we have level of arousal. So this is just a general term talking about uh, sort of activation within the body. So higher levels of arousal could be interpreted as higher levels of stress. And lower levels would be then lower levels of stress. And so for this diagram, we actually have three different curves, which can be a little bit confusing. But if we just envision it using, say, one, we would say that um, there's sort of a moderate level of arousal or a moderate stress level that would let us perform very well at a task. And if we are too low in that level of stress, then maybe we don't care so much about the task and we don't do well because we're not putting any effort into it. Or if we are too stressed, if it is too high of a stressor, then maybe we're going to perform poorly because we can't focus. Um, and so what these three different lines are showing us here is that for some tasks, when they're more complex, a lower level of arousal is going to be a more optimal state. Um, if you're doing very, very simple tasks, you could tolerate doing them under high levels of stress. But the more complex the task, the less stress you'd rather be under if you want to perform optimally. So it's just sort of an extension of this specific law. There we go. In contrast to that idea of sort of having a moderate level of stress that is optimal, sometimes we might see the maximal adaptability model. And this emphasizes that animals, including humans, are highly adaptive to stressors and can maintain high levels of performance even when experiencing overload or underload in terms of demands of the environment. So that's sort of saying that instead of having that curve that we just saw, they would more expect to see a straight line where we're going to perform optimally all of the time. So saying that we are highly adaptable and aren't going to be affected by having not enough environmental influence and not too much environmental influence. So our first model was using that curve, and then the second model is losing sort of this straight line here. Okay, so that's a pretty decent discussion. Um, next, we're going to start talking about different kinds of stressors. So we're sticking with our external stimuli. We'll eventually talk about our stress responses, that sort of internal response, but not quite yet, starting off with our stressors. So if we want to talk about different types of stressors, we can define them based on differences in duration and severity. So we, so we have three basic broad categories that most researchers can agree on. The first is acute stressors. So these are short-term external circumstances or stimuli that last minutes to hours. So this is going to be something that is very short-term and is not usually overly severe. Chronic stressors are things that endure. Still external circumstances are stimuli, but now they're going to last for weeks to years. And if I was asking you to distinguish between acute and chronic, I would sort of uh, avoid that middle area of sort of days because we're saying sort of minutes to hours is short and weeks to years is long. So we'd make sure to pick an example that fits nicely into those sort of very different categories. Um, but both acute stressors and chronic stressors would be pretty low severity. But then our last category, these traumatic stressors, and these are, or these are stressors involving threat to your own or another's life or physical integrity. So these are highly severe stressors. Um, so they might be short in duration, they might be a little bit longer in duration, but it's the intensity, the severity, that defines this category of stressor. And so if we wanted to look at some examples here, an acute stressor would be sitting in rush hour traffic for a couple of hours. It's not too intensive and it's not too, too long. Um, if we wanted something chronic, we would be looking at, say, the long-term care of an ill parent. That's something that persists for years. So it would fall under that chronic treatment or, sorry, chronic stressor. And then traumatic is when we have that immediate threat to our physical integrity. And that'd be something like experiencing a natural disaster or being the victim of a crime. Those would fall under examples for that category. So those are our stressors and types of stressors. Now let's look at our stress response. What's going on internally in response to those external stressors? So if 
these uh, stress experiences, if our reactions to feeling stressed are so awful, if we feel sick to our stomach, if we feel anxious or nervous, if we can't sleep, if we're restless, we're having trouble eating, how are all of these bad things beneficial? How could we have evolved to experience all of these unpleasant things? Um, how is it helpful to have these? Because um, we just had that discussion about there being beneficial stressors. So is there going to be some kind of beneficial response? So the idea here is that our stress response serves to protect us from harm and restore balance to the body. So we have a response to stress where we're going to want to avoid stressful situations. We're, want to get, we're going to want to get away from situations that make us uncomfortable um, and hopefully get to somewhere safer where we are less threatened. And so we've talked about this balance within the body quite a few times, and uh, this as always goes with the term of homeostasis. And so this is the state of balance within our bodies that ends up being upset by stressors that we are trying to restore using our stress responses. So homeostasis just refers to our body having sort of natural levels of balance where we would like to exist. And this can be everything from heart rate to body temperature to blood pressure to uh, energy levels, whatever we want to look at. There are natural levels in our body and our body has sort of this comfortable range where it likes to exist at. So when our body is in those comfortable ranges, we are at homeostasis. But when we deviate from that comfort level, when we're pushed outside of that balance by stressors, then we have our stress responses to try and get us back into balance, to try and maintain that homeostatic balance once again. So our stress responses are going to be coordinated bodily responses that allow us to mobilize energy to deal with a stressor that we're being faced with, to try and avoid injury, um, and reduce risk for er, infection and inflammation. So we want to try and avoid things that could be problematic, things that could be damaging to us. Um, and so adapt or adaptations are going to be things that allow us to produce these responses in order to prolong our lives, allow us to survive longer and theoretically reproduce more um, because that's what natural selection is focused on is living longer and passing on more of your genes. So any kind of traits, any kind of behaviors that allow us to survive longer, um, hopefully by having less injuries, those are going to be passed on more and are going to become more common in our populations. Now we're going to be talking about a couple of different parts of the brain that are involved in our stress response. And so this image here is just a nice way for us to visualize where these different areas are located. So our earliest stress responses are going to begin in the amygdala. We're also going to have involvement from our hippocampus. Um, that's going to help us consolidate memories relating to our stressor if we manage to get through it um, so that we know how to react in the future. Our prefrontal cortex is going to allow us to do some evaluation and make decisions on what we're going to do. Um, and then the thalamus is sort of right in the middle there. So we're going to talk mostly about the prefrontal cortex cortex, amygdala, and hippocampus, um, and we're going to get those in a little bit more detail, but this is just a nice visual to figure out where they're at. Um, so here, our amygdala, like I said, is going to respond very, very rapidly. It's going to be our initial response point. It's the earliest of our stress responses. And it's going to sometimes start reacting even before we have any conscious awareness of that threat. So it's ready and waiting to respond to uh, potential stressors, and it can respond very, very rapidly. And it's going to work in coordination with those other brain areas to end up increasing or decreasing the amygdala's response. So maybe you're going to have a very strong reaction in your amygdala. Maybe you see a bear and you panic. But your prefrontal cortex, which does some higher order processing, maybe it tells you that, oh, no, it's OK. It's a poster of a bear. It's not a real bear. So you can calm your amygdala's response. So we can have sort of this interplay between all these different areas. And as I said, our hippocampus is involved in learning and memory. So this is going to allow us to consolidate new memories that are coming in. 
Um, and we're actually really good at encoding memories that are tied to strong emotions. So stress responses in particular allow us to form very intense and tangible memories. So that's going to be really important. Um, and it's also going to allow us to connect to memories that we already have. So things that we've experienced in the past, and we can sort of integrate what's happening now and sort of predict what might happen in the future based on our previous experiences. So that's something good to keep in mind. And then as we said, our, higher, our prefrontal cortex is that higher order processing where we start putting things together. We start interpreting things. We consider other factors to see something as more or less threatening. And then we can decide what is safe versus unsafe and sort of mediate our stress response that way. 